Hey family, it is Pastor Carrie, and welcome back for our daily devotion. Listen, you all know, come on, you know what to do. Let me know where you're from. I want you to like this. I want you to share this. If you're watching us for the first time, so blessed to be able to have you. I'm Pastor Carrie, and I serve as one of the staff pastors right here at New Birth, and we are led by Dr. Jamal H. Bryant. This is our time at 12:30 on Tuesdays, where we get a little dose of the daily devotion for the week, and I'm so glad that you are here. Listen, I want you to stay connected with me and you can do that by following me at Ms. Carrie Baby on Instagram. And I want you to stay connected with the church and you can do that by going to wearenewbirth.org. Listen, you all, I can't even believe it is December, y'all. We are in December. And listen, by his grace, we have made it literally to the last month of the year. And I can only tell you that it is truly by the favor of God, truly by the grace of God that we have made it this far. And this month, our senior pastor has charged us to read a chapter of Luke every day leading up to Christmas. And I don't know about you, but it has truly been a blessing to me. I'm seeing things in the book of Luke that I've not even seen before or probably hadn't really paid attention to that has really blessed our life. And so what that means is that our daily devotions each week will focus on the chapter of Luke on the day that we fall on. And so listen, I'm so excited today to jump right into Luke 7. If you have your Bible, I want you to pull out Luke 7 because that's what we'll focus on for today. And listen, I pray that you've had some time to read it already. And if not, I want you to go back and take some time to read it after our time together. Our focus today in Luke 7 is I'm about to get it back. I am about to get it back. That's what we're focusing on today. Now, as you can imagine, it's gonna be impossible for us to cover the entire chapter. You know, it's too much to cover, but my heart is to really highlight a few areas that has resonated with me during my devotion time of reading a chapter in Luke. And as I share those things with you, that the Holy Spirit speaks to me in my time. And so that's what I wanna do. We can't get to everything, but I wanna highlight what the Holy Spirit has illuminated to me during my personal devotion time of reading. So listen, let's just talk a little bit about who Luke was before we jump in. You know, truly not very much is known about Luke. Luke, as we know, was a very close friend of Paul, who Paul referred to as the beloved physician. And so we know that Luke was a physician. And not only was he a physician, but he was also the only Gentile writer, the only uncircumcised writer to contribute to the New Testament. Uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Beyond this, theologians believe that he was very educated as he was a master in the Greek language. Uh, he was also very well traveled and very well educated, having a tremendous impact on documenting the gospel. You know, Luke's life, if nothing else, is a very clear example to us that although we may set out on one path, yeah, Although there's a way in which we thought our life would go because he was really at first a physician, we know that God has a way of rerouting us, shifting us into a different direction for the ultimate fulfillment of his will in the earth. And we saw that in the life of Luke. Can I tell you that Luke chapter seven, it's rich. Wherever y'all are, I want you to just type in the chat, it's rich. Luke chapter seven, in and of itself is very rich. And there are so many things, so many principles, so many elements that we can draw from and discuss today. You know, as there are a number of illustrations offered in this one, in this one chapter alone that are filled with life lessons and wisdoms for, for daily application and daily, you know, practical things that we can implement in our life. But today, I, I want us to focus on a number of different things. Listen, I want us to focus on a few things that we could focus on. Like for instance, in the book of, of chapter seven of Luke, one of the first things that we see in chapter seven is the faith of the centurion man. We know that the Lord Jesus was pleased with his level of faith and humility. We could talk about him today, but I don't want us to talk about him. Or we could talk about Jesus and John the Baptist. Uh, answering John the Baptist's question. And the text says in verse 20, it says, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come 
or should we expect another? Listen, and, and we go further down where Jesus says, this is the one in whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So listen, we're not gonna talk about that today, even though we could, because that in and of itself is rich. We could talk about Jesus and the anoint, anointed by the sinful woman. Listen, where we read in the text, while having dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house, a woman ridden with guilt of her past sins begins to wash, y'all know this story, the feet of Jesus with her own tears. Listen, and drying his feet with the locks of her hair. And we know in this particular part of the text that Simon the Pharisee cannot believe the behavior of the sinful woman, but Jesus then forgives her sins whose faith was high and bids her peace and farewell that's so much that we could talk about too but we're not going to talk about that today there are so many amazing stories in this chapter but i really want us if we can to focus on luke 7 11 through 16. and this is the part of the chapter in luke 7 where jesus encounters the widow verse 11 reads soon after jesus went to a town called Nain." and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Verse 14, it says, then he went up and touched the bier they were laying him on. And the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Verse 16 says, they were all filled with awe and praised God. Listen, I want us to focus on this part of Luke 7 today. Listen, in the text, we saw in verse 11 that Jesus was entering a town called Nain. And if you know anything about Nain, it was a Galilean town that was not very far from Nazareth. And what Nain meant was beauty and pleasantness. That's what the town of Nain meant. It meant beauty and pleasantness. And so when we go to verse 12, we see that as Christ is approaching the town gate, he sees that a dead person was being carried out. Listen, and it says the only son of his mother and she was a widow. Listen, in this particular part of the text, they were in the midst of having a funeral procession, which marks the beginning of a funeral service, where the text, the text highlights for us that a widow was preparing to funeralize her only son. Now, this is significant to us because it is very clear from her status as outlined in the text that she is a widow who lived in name. She is a widow who lived in a beautiful and pleasant place. But this woman, this widow who lived in a beautiful and pleasant place had become accustomed to death as she had already lost her husband. She, she had already lost her companion. She had lost her lover, her friend, and ultimately she lost her primary provider. But because she had a son, her only son, in early biblical times, the son would take up where the father had left off. And so he would then care for and provide financially for his mother. But what we see in the text is we now find her in the midst of eating, uh, uh, going to bury her only son. She is in the midst of having to bury her only son, which means that he was her last source of aid. Yeah. Her only son was her last source of security. He was her only last source of economic stability. And her son, her only son had just died. Her husband had already died. And so now a widow who now has lost her son as well, her only son. And I keep emphasizing that because it is critically important. He was her only son. And so during this time, a widow in her condition would really be subject to economic collapse because women couldn't own land during that time. She would also be really facing possible homelessness as widows were also uh, frequently abused and they were also exploited. 
in her life in this moment, I can imagine that this is probably the darkest time that she had ever seen. It was bad when she lost her husband, but listen, she had her only son to take care of her. And now the one son that she had left has also died. But listen, before she could even get the body in the ground, the text says to her, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Can I tell you that in the midst of her worry, in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her confusion, Christ sees her. Yeah, hallelujah. And he comforts her so much so that he personally began to move on her behalf. Can I tell you that I'm reminded in this part of the text in Hebrews 4 and 15, the word of the Lord says, for we do not have a high priest, hallelujah, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. It says, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet he did not sin. What does that mean? That meant in that moment, we have a savior. We have a redeemer who is not far from the human experience as he came down and lived it just as we did. So in that moment, he could empathize. He could have compassion with her. Aren't you glad that in your lowest moments, hallelujah, that you don't have a God who sits so high that he cannot reach you? Aren't you glad in your, in your moments of destitute that you don't have a God who is a statue and cannot feel that you don't have a God who won't personally come into your situation and touch the very thing that you are in need of. Can I tell you, yeah, yeah, that I'm glad in my moments of loneliness. I'm glad in my moments of sadness that I have a God who cares, yeah, and is concerned. I believe that this is why the Bible tells us that we can cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. It also tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I believe that the Lord shares that with us because he is familiar with what it means, hallelujah, to be burdened with something in the human experience, that he is acquainted with what pain looks like, hallelujah, that he is acquainted with what sorrow looks like. And so in this moment, he didn't keep walking past her. He didn't say he got to get to a ministry event, hallelujah. He didn't say he had to get to prayer meeting. He didn't say that he had to get to his business or he had other work to do, but he stopped in the middle of what he was doing on his way to where he was journeying to and he saw her and had compassion on her. Can I tell you that even in this moment, listen, it's possible as we see through the eyes of the widow, that it's possible to live in the dichotomy of residing in a beautiful place, hear this, in a pleasant place, all while experiencing some of the greatest grief of your life. Y'all don't hear me. Listen, it's possible to live in the duality of many things being beautiful in other areas of your life, but you can also be suffering from sadness. Can I tell you, you can be in a beautiful place and still be dealing with anxiety. Can I tell you, you can be in a beautiful and a pleasant place and still be dealing with depression. Can I tell you that you can be in the middle of a beautiful place and still be suicidal? Listen, you can still be going through extreme losses all the while people are surrounded around you thinking that since you live in a beautiful place, that everything is good, or you can live in a beautiful and pleasant place, name, and publicly have to, and publicly have to have people watch you mourn something that you love so deeply. Having a crowd of people have to watch you mourn something that has died in your life. Can I tell you, for some of you, you have never gotten the opportunity, hallelujah, to mourn privately over something that died. Listen, as your business was put on public display, yeah, all of your business was in front of the crowd that watched you as you had to mourn your dreams, mourn the death of your dreams, as, as you had to mourn the collapse of your marriage, as, as you've had to mourn the, 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 the failure of your business, as you have had to mourn your health being in a dire state. I don't see no hearts. I don't see no lights. You've had to have public people watch you as your children have taken the wrong path 
You had to have people watch you as love and good relationships never seem to find you. You've had to have crowds of people watch you as you seem to remain in enormous amounts of debt, feeling like you were never going to break through, feeling like wealth would never come to your household. You've had to watch, have crowds of people watch you as you continue to be barren and you seem like you can't produce any of you for you. You are, for some of you, you are literally trying to have a child and you seem to be unable to do so. For some of you, you have had to watch, have crowds of people watch you as you have been seated in the back, huh? anointed and seated in the back, anointed and overlooked in the back, anointed and never having your name called, anointed and being the low one on the totem pole, anointed and never ne never having anybody recognize what is on you. You've always been seated in the back and never called to the front. Can I tell you, and not only did you go through it, but, but you didn't just go through it privately, but you had to go through all of this stuff in public. You, you had to go through it, through it in front of the crowd. You had to go through it in front of your family, in front of your friends. But can I offer you tonight, can I offer you today on this Good Tuesday, that Christ is about to restore everything to you that you lost in front of the same people that what you had to mourn over your loss will be the same people that he restores of in front of. Listen, verse 14 says, then he went up and touched the bier where they were carrying him on and the bearer stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Can I tell you that this text reminds me that Christ is always on time. Somebody just put in the chat that God is always on time. Listen, I'm certain that as the widow was preparing to bury her only son, having to bury what she believed, hallelujah, was her last opportunity at living a good life, at, at living a decent life, even though her husband was gone. Can I tell you that God came out of nowhere? Can I, can I speak to you today that, to tell you that even in the midst of your sorrow, that God is a master, hallelujah, at coming out of nowhere and seeing her compassion and show, listen, he saw her and he was compassionate towards her. He saw her cries and I believe he heard the words in her heart that she never even spoke out loud. Can I speak to you today to tell you that there are things that you have not even been able to say out loud because because of the pain that it caused you, but God heard you. Can I tell you that the Father has saw your cries and he is getting ready to walk right into your situation. Listen, and immediately at the word of the Lord, what was dead has been resurrected. I didn't make it up, but it's in the text. The Lord spoke to the man and he not only did he get up, but he began to declare a thing and God gave him back to his mother. Can I tell you on this good Tuesday, I know it's just our daily devotion, but can I tell you that whatever you thought died, hallelujah, in 2021, it won't be dead long enough for it to even make it into the ground. For they were just processing when Christ walked up to them. They hadn't even had an opportunity to bury the men. But can I tell you that God is getting ready to speak just like he did in this text. He is getting ready to speak directly to your situation. And I declare today that it shall live and not die. So can I tell you this? You might as well cancel the funeral service. You might as well cancel the repast. You might as well tell them that you're not going on with it because God is getting ready to restore everything that you thought that you lost, huh? He's getting ready to yield recompense in front of the same crowd that was only there to watch you mourn. Can I take it? Listen, wherever you are, I just want you to type, I'm about to get it back. God is about to restore everything to you that you had to lose and mourn publicly. The Father is getting ready to restore it back to you your house and not only is he going to raise it up but that thing is getting ready to speak on your behalf and God is going to return it back to you the text says the dead man sat up hallelujah 
and began to talk glory to God. And Jesus gives him back to his mother. Whatever you thought was dead is about to speak and it is about to be returned to you. I know you thought it was over. I know you thought, listen, let me make plans for it. There is no way that this thing can come back to life. But let me tell you, God, all throughout the biblical text, not just in this moment, he is a master at raising things from the dead. Why? Because he rose from the dead. He was able to take death, all of the power from death. Listen, oh, death, where is your sting? Can, I, can you type somewhere? Death has no victory. It has no victory in my relationships. It has no victory in my money. It has no victory in my ministry. It has no victory in my health. It has no victory in my career. It has no victory in my business. Everything that the enemy thought it killed, the Lord is getting ready to resurrect. Listen, as we enter into a new year, listen, and it shall speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shall, it'll get up and it's gonna speak and it will be returned to you. Listen, I don't even have time to fully deal with that, but I want to skip down to verse 16 and the text says they were all filled with awe and praise God. Can I tell you that your recompense is about to cause others to believe and get and God get the glory from your testimony? Can I tell you the very thing that you thought would kill you publicly? Hallelujah. The very thing that you thought you had to mourn in front of crowds of people. Can I declare to you, hallelujah, that there was a reason for the crowd? Glory to God. You thought that it was, you thought that it was to mock you. You thought that it was to persecute you. You thought that it was just so that there would be an audience to see your failure, an audience to see your fears, an audience to see your downfall, an audience to see your pain. But can I tell you that God will get the glory out of anything? And he is a master at using crowds even for his benefit as you are the vessel. So listen, God is able to use the crowd to as an to use you as an example in the crowd to show that even in moments of great sadness, in moments of great hurt, in moments of great pain, that ultimately even the crowd will begin to glorify God because they will begin, hallelujah, to see with their own eyes. They will begin to see with their own eyes what God is able to do. They will be able to get to, to, to witness the testimony that God begins to do in your life. And ultimately the same people, hallelujah, that came to see you mourn the death of a thing. Glory to God will be the same people that will have to be there to bless the name of the Lord for what he resurrected in your life. Listen, y'all, I know that this is just Tuesday, but can I tell you how it blessed my soul? Can I declare to you today that God is about to restore everything to you that you thought you lost in 2021? Everything that you began to write an obituary for, everything that you began to make plans to bury, the word of the Lord will come forth and bring that thing back to life. There is not, not only did he bring it back to life, but the thing began to speak. The man began to speak which says to me that that thing will begin to bear witness to what the Father has done in your life and it will come back to you. Listen, this has blessed me. I pray that you have really been reading Luke and if you've not done it, I want you to start today. I want you to get back into reading it because it has truly, truly, truly blessed me. And I pray that today has blessed you. Listen, I wanna pray for us before we go. Father, we thank you today, hallelujah. We thank you that you see us, glory to God. We thank you, God, that not only do you see, Father, but that you are compassionate towards what we've gone through, hallelujah. Lord, and not only that, but you personally get involved in our situation. God, you, you know every, every intricacy of what we've gone through. And Father, you come in. God, and you are able to speak a word, Father, that will bring back to life that in which we thought had died. And so, Father, we love you. We honor and we give you glory today for redemption, 
for the power of recompense and the restoration, Father, that we shall see, not just privately, Father, but what we shall see publicly at your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, if this word has blessed you today, I want you to sow. You can do it by using the prompts below. And if you say, Pastor Carrie, listen, I want to join this ministry because this has really pierced my heart today. And I am believing God for more. And I want to be a part of a community of people who believe that too. You can do that. You can join right now by using the prompts below. Listen, y'all got me crying on this here. Uh, listen, on this here live today, but I love you so much. I'm praying for you. I hope you're praying for me. And we are believing God for redemption and recompense. We're believing God that we're going to get it back as we go into this new, listen, not even in the new year yet. Right now, we're believing God to give it back to us. I'm believing it for me and I'm believing it for you. I love you and I pray to see you again next week by God's grace. See you. Seasons greetings and happy holidays, new birth. It's time for our video announcements. Are you doing the Luke challenge? Our pastor has commissioned us to read one chapter of the book of Luke daily, which gives us a full account of Jesus's life. There are 24 chapters, so read one daily and wake up on Christmas morning with a new understanding of who Christ was and why we celebrate. New birth, Jesus is the reason for the season and we want to bless our children with Christmas gifts. Please help us make Christmas City at our new birth holiday pull up a success by donating new unwrapped toys. Please drop off your gifts at our Family Life Center or our administrative entrance on the steeple side today and December 11th and 12th between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Please register to volunteer or to make a financial contribution, visit the link on your screen. Our King's Table will be closed December 19th through January 31st. For local resources, please contact the Atlanta Community Food Bank at 404-892-3333 or visit acfb.org. New birth, we have an amazing New Year's Eve celebration planned just for you. Friday, December 31st, will be our very first service back in our sanctuary. We will begin with an exciting first service at 12 noon. Our evening service at 10.30 p.m. will feature the award-winning duo, Mary Mary. Stay tuned for more details. Save the date for our New Year's revival on Tuesday, January 11th through Thursday, January 13th. Get ready for three amazing nights of prophetic ministry featuring Dion Baez. And that's it for today's video announcements.